I'm Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint. And we're here at the Hollywood Park, just below the famous Hollywood sign. Um, I was invited to actually do the spring um, gardening class at one of the residents, and we're expecting about 30 to 40 people. And in this garden class, we're actually going to be talking about several topics. The main ones I want to share with you right now is um, we're going to be discussing tom tomato plant planting and tomato care and how to fertilize them to keep them going throughout the year um, and discussing the importance of using organic fertilizers as well. Um, additionally, we're going to be um, working on potting a tree as well. And this tree next to me is the Moro Blood Orange Citrus Tree. Um, and we're going to be discussing how to pot it, um, the types of soils to use, the types of fertilizers to use. And additionally, we've even coated it with Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard paint. Um, as you can see by the lighter bark that we have on this tree. Um, we've also rescued several trees that are actually around me today, this last summer. Um, they're actually suffering from sunburn as well. So, and that's another reason that we're actually here today. Um, so we're gonna be discussing Ivory Organics 3-in-1 tree guard paint. And we're also gonna be talking about um, using salt in your garden. Do not dare to use sodium chloride or your table salt in your gardens. But this here is a salt you can pick up from your garden center that's loaded with magnesium and sulfate, which are critical for turning your pale green plants and your yellow plants to a bright, luscious green. Um, additionally, we're going to be using Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard paint. We are going to add about one to two teaspoons per gallon of water and using it as a sunblock to also help your newly transplanted plants um, get the protection from the sun, especially in the early days, weeks, and months to keep the plants cool while they actually get established. And the same thing can be done for your citrus trees where we're going to be applying some sunblock to the leaves as well. Again, this, plant, this product is organic and safe to use on your plants and in your gardens. Um, and you may be familiar with other gardeners that use latex white paint, but take a look at the back of that product and the warnings that are on there and the diseases that it causes. And additionally, um, they, most of those paint products have algicides and fungicides in them. They're actually damaging the plant tissue as well. So um, be cautious when using um, over-the-counter paint products from your, um, from your paint department. Instead, you should be looking for something organic, such as our product, which actually has protection against insects and rodents as well. Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint. And you'll be enjoying um, this garden class with um, entertainment from J.D. Sebastian, who will be providing um, live jazz entertainment. And he's also providing the filming and recording of this um, YouTube video. Thanks again and enjoy. And what's unique about spring is, and we also have it in the fall, is the equinox. It's the balance of equal days and equal nights. Um, our equinox was actually on March 19th, even though spring was on March 20th. Um, so sometimes spring doesn't necessarily match exactly with the equinox. Um, and the change, which I think is important to point out as well, is on the equinox, the daylight is changing by an average of about two minutes. I wrote two minutes and eight seconds, but it's changing really fast around the equinox, whereas when you're actually in the middle of winter and in the middle of summer, the daylight is not changing as fast. It'll actually, the days around it only change by as much as 0.01 seconds, you know, those days surrounding it and, then it, and then it speeds up again as it approaches the equinox. So I thought it was an interesting point to point out. Um, and then I wanted to go, so right now we've got about 12 hours of light, 12 hours of day, but by the time we get to June, for where we are, we'll have 14 hours and 25 minutes of light. So we're still working within the next three months, we've got to gain another two hours and 25 minutes of additional light. And that's what helps our plants grow. This is the reason we plant all of our vegetables and we do all the things that we do in our gardens now. Um, the growing season is, I've got a question for you guys and let's see what kind of answers we get back. The growing season is most affected by day or night temperatures. And I wrote Los Angeles versus Honolulu um, and you'll see why in a minute. But is our growing season most affected by our daytime warm temperatures or our nighttime cold temperatures? Does anybody say daytime high temperatures? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. And then does anybody say nighttime low temperatures? Yeah. Wow. Um, so the majority said nighttime and the answer is yes, it's night. 
Um, the reason we can actually almost grow all the things that they grow in Hawaii is because our nighttime temperatures rarely go below freezing. Um, the fact that our nights are considered warm is the reason we can grow all the things that are tropical. The difference between Los Angeles and Honolulu is Honolulu gets rain and Los Angeles doesn't. But as long as you water your gardens, you can pretty much grow everything that's growing in Hawaii. Um, so in my backyard, um, and I had a guest that came over yesterday, I've got my passion fruit vines, I've got guavas, I got um, ice cream banana trees, I got all these tropical fruits. Um, and it's because you can grow them here as long as it doesn't freeze. Um, so that's the benefit of living here in Southern California. One of the benefits. Um, on the next slide, I wrote which vegetables grow best in spring. I'm kind of going to skip this one, but the important point is what's in the smallest writing in the bottom right hand corner, which says plant your winter and fall tolerant veggies in shady areas. And those would be your, if you're going to grow cabbages and beets and like the things you typically grow in the fall and through the winter, peas um, and those things. If you put them in your shadier spots in your garden, they'll actually thrive much better than if you put them in the sunniest spots. Um, where they'll just bolt quickly and turn into flowers and not produce um, what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, the next slide says, which vegetables grow best in spring? And I wrote, only plant the things you eat and plant things about every three to five weeks just to keep the cycle within your garden going. Um, I wanted to point out, and I don't know if you noticed, um, JD in the back is actually recording this, and I wanted to bring out this point um, when I was showing all of the garden classes that we've done so far. I think this is our 13th one now, and we have nothing to show for it. Um, so <laughs> it's in the back. We have some pictures. All over my place. We got butterflies. We're going to talk about milkweeds, which is actually this plant right here. Yeah. I've got about 10 of these plants um, off here in the right, so I'll put the flowers next to the plants so at the end you can pick one up. Uh, my neighbor, if you don't mind me sharing, um, she actually has about, I think, 10? Nine. So there's nine caterpillars actually that she's raising now? I went out and there were 12 of them on my... Already? And the next day there was one because yeah. the birds died. Yeah. So that's the reason. Um, <laughs> it's a spectacular sight. And I'm hoping um, for our summer garden class, maybe we can share the whole life cycle of the monarch butterflies, which yeah. if you haven't heard yet, the monarch butterfly, we're on the decline. Um, they're still considered endangered somewhat, but haven't hit the list yet. Um, but apparently in the last year, they made about a two to 300% comeback. And I think it's in part just because of awareness. Um, I don't want to say it's all because of me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I've been giving away plants like at almost every single garden class for, and, um, and I know just between Ola and I, I've been farming it. I know she's been farming it too, but for some reason I get, I think more caterpillars, except the start, it hasn't been so good yet for me. Um, So that's the balance. But um, last year, I think she raised about 40. So she released 40 into, in, into this world that probably would have been eaten by birds. And, you know, and hope, I think we're going to do even better this year. Um, so my point is we're going to record this and hopefully um, publish it. None of you will be in the video. But it's just so that this content, this information is not um, gone after this, aside from the pictures that usually go in the newsletter. OK? Um, so that's that. Um, Going back, back to the plantings, um, plant only the things you want to eat. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but um, one of the properties I actually visited a couple days ago, I saw this fruit and I'm like, can I please have one? There was like 10 of these on the tree and, I, um, and he ended up giving me like all of them. And I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to enjoy eating one of these every day. Um, and then I'll tell you in a minute. And then, and then he said, but take these two. And I'm like, this looks horrible. It's grayish green. And... Um, and so it was like last night after I finished this presentation that I finally like got into eating this. Um, and I wiped my hands before I did this, but is there anybody that would dare to, actually I'm gonna open this up just so you can see what it is. Um, they're both grapefruits. Um, it's uh, like a, I'll tell you what he did. Um, so these trees, he basically grows most of his trees from seedlings. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages of doing that and I'll get to it in a minute. Um, but Here's the fruit. How does that look to you? The first, no, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to first, um, I'm going to see if I can get like two or three um, daring people to like try it. And I'll actually cut it into sections here. Yeah? I'm done. That's all I'm going to cut. 
do I have anybody willing to try it so we can compare it? But whoever tries it is going to try two grapefruits. Come on, Richard. I just need four samplers, just so you can tell me. So hopefully we get one more. Here we go. And if anybody wants to keep cutting at it, you can help yourself. I'll pass the knife around. Here's the other one now. So this is what it looks like. Impressive or not? No. So not so good. No, they're, they're all done. Yeah. So now here's four more sections. Whoever had that last piece, try this. And whoever's hungry can keep going. Um, so do I have a vote on pink or white? The white one. This one's like, like jerky. <laughs> <laughs> this is grapefruit jerky. It's almost like chalk. This one looks a little juicier than the other one. So the white one is juicier than the pink one. Agreed? Agreed? Agreed. So, so the first one I opened yesterday, I couldn't even take the first bite. It was so bad I threw the whole thing away. The second one, I'm like, the flavor was good. But it's still not worth planting in my garden. I do, it doesn't deserve a spot. This one here is loaded with seeds. Like when I cut it, I have to cut around, around the edges. There's a lot of like center part that's missing by the time I finish it. Um, but the point of this is when you grow from seed, and especially when it comes to your fruits, that you're going to invest the next five to 10 years waiting for that first fruit to come. <laughs> if you waited for this after 10 years, <laughs> you wasted your time. Um, so when it comes to being like a successful gardener and you want to share your garden and be proud of all the things that are in it, you got to make sure good things are going in it. And one of the um, points I wrote here is a huge part of your success, and this is my handwriting, is starting with good genetics. Um, there's some people you'll see in books and on YouTube or wherever else where they've got cabbages that are this big and beets that are that large. And it's like, what are they fertilizing their plants with? And sometimes they talk about fertilizer, but it's not that. The smarter teachers in the, you know, in the gardening world will usually say you got to start off with good genetics, and that makes the most sense. If you actually start off with the big, giant, 300-pound pumpkin seeds, your chances are when you plant it, you're going to get a 300-pound pumpkin. And if you're growing the, you know, the mini ones, you're going to get a mini pumpkin. You're not going to get, or if you plant the white seeds, you're going to get white pumpkins. So if you start off with the genetics that you want, then that's what you're going to get in your, in your garden. Um, and so that's my lesson with the grapefruit and to make sure that you put the things that you want in your garden. Um, the next um, slide says, which vegetables grow best in spring? And um, I, I know, um, I was about to say I think, but I know for the last three years, I always talk about tomatoes. I think tomatoes are the best vegetable, at least for me and my garden. Um, and I know for other people, they've been struggling with tomatoes, so it might not be their best, whereas peppers might be their best vegetable or or beets might be their best vegetable. So plant the things that actually work in your soil. Um, and there could be a whole bunch of reasons why um, one particular plant might work better for you than others. Um, but things to consider always is the soil, the way you fertilize your, so um, your garden, the amount of sunlight. Too much sun can be an issue, and we're going to talk about that as well. I know with someone I met with um, that had issues with tomatoes, we discussed maybe putting a sunscreen over it to kind of filter the amount of light because it's just too intense. It kind of burns the plants as they're just getting ready to flower and fruit. Um, so some plants might need a little bit more attention and care. Something else that's not in my slide and I have to address so I don't forget it while I'm talking about tomatoes it, and from visiting a lot of gardens is the difference between drip irrigation and then using like your sprinkler spray system. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about organic fertilizers, soils, um, and just other ways to create a healthy soil to, to, you know, to result in healthy vegetables. We'll talk about the different types of fertilizers, the macronutrients, the micronutrients. Um, but what's most important, and I'm going to take it back to you know, us as even people, um, more important than food. And for the plant to make food, all they need is a leaf and some sun, and they can start making food. Um, but the biggest issue, and the reasons a lot of trees in Los Angeles are now dying, is water. We can go without food, but we can't go without water. 
Um, and this relates to your soil as well. If you're doing the drip irrigation, it's just dripping. And you can imagine like if it's dripping here at this point and coming down as a cone, you might be missing a whole section of soil that's still dry if your drip irrigation is just going straight down into a very, you know, you can imagine like a funnel of area that's getting wet, but you're missing um, where plants actually, their roots are usually within the top two feet of the soil anyways. We know that tomatoes can um, grow roots that are six to eight feet, but the majority of roots, even on avocado trees, they're known for only, um, you pretty much have to take care of the top two feet of soil, and that'll pretty much take care of 99% of the tree. Um, so keep that in mind as you're you know, caring for your trees, that you really just gotta stay shallow and it makes the biggest difference. So which vegetables to grow um, in the spring? And I'm highlighting again tomatoes, and until my committee tells me to do otherwise, I'm gonna keep doing tomatoes every spring, and I'll always have enough tomatoes for everybody um, when you leave. The two things to keep in mind when you're adding more tomatoes in your garden is to decide if you're going to do a determinate variety or an indeterminate variety. And the determinate varieties typically grow their length, they flower all at once, they fruit all at once, and the whole plant dies all at once. Um, and one good example of, an, of a determinate variety is aroma tomato. Um, so you'll basically harvest all your tomatoes all at once and you're done. Um, in contrast, a variety I brought with me today is the early girl, um, as well as some cherry varieties. And those are considered indeterminate. They typically grow taller, and they'll fruit and flower at every stage throughout the spring, the summer, going into fall. Um, and some people are lucky enough they can carry them over year after year. And again, only because our nighttime temperatures, as long as it doesn't get too cold, will continue. But I personally prefer to start over every, every spring. And here in um, Southern California, you can actually start gardening as early as like February. Our last frost is, if there is gonna be one, is usually the first week of January. Um, is there like our last chance of frost is the, again, first week of January. Um, and our first chance of frost is like right around the second or third month of December, and that's it. So there's like a two to three week window where there's a chance of frost and then all of a sudden it starts warming up again. Um, I wrote on the slide here, um, Kinds, kinds to consider are hybrid tomatoes, which are basically when you're crossing two different varieties to create a hybrid. Um, heirloom varieties, which are um, defined on another page, it just basically means it's been in circulation for typically 40 to 50 years or longer. Um, and then grafted varieties is where they're using a root um, of a plant, maybe because of disease resistance or because of the vigor of the plant, it'll grow faster or stronger, or maybe to keep it smaller and more compact. So the roots will control that, and then you just graft the variety that you want. Grafting, actually, if I go back to this, if this variety was a hit, let's say it's a ruby star grapefruit, and I got like the best, most delicious, most best tasting, sweetest red grapefruit. And just to let you know, if you're going to plant a grapefruit, um, the white ones are considered sweeter than the, um, than the pink ones. The pink ones look better, but the white ones are typically sweeter. Um, I just added one and did a lot of research on grapefruit before I picked one for my garden. Um, so, but something to consider is if this were the plant that, of choice that I wanted in my garden and I now sub visited the tree, I would actually be able to take a piece of branch off of that um, plant and actually graft it on the type of rootstock I wanted. If I wanted a dwarf, and we're going to talk about sizes when we talk about the citrus tree over here, um, but if I grafted it onto a dwarf rootstock, then it'll grow on average between two to four feet. If I put it on a semi-dwarf plant, it'll grow from like four to 15 feet. If I graft it on a standard size tree, it'll grow from 15 to 25 feet. So depending on the root, I've got exactly the same plant, which I grafted on top, that'll give me exactly the same size fruit and quality of fruit, but I'm controlling according to my property or, or where I'm gonna plant it, I'll decide if I want a dwarf that might live in a container or a standard size tree that I'm gonna put you know, as, as, a, main, as a main tree in my, in my garden. So, Um, another important consideration when planting your tomatoes is um, blossom end rot. Tomatoes more than um, most vegetables need calcium. Um, and actually all plants need some calcium in the soil to, to perform best. Um, what happened here all of a sudden? Well, I, I can't believe it. Huh. Been <coughs> and it happened, um, we saw it up in the estates the other day, the same thing. Uh. Anyways. Uh, 
So anyways, take care of each other while those guys are flying around us. Um, so something to consider when planting now your tomatoes, you're going to want to fertilize the soil. You're going to have a couple of choices out there. Um, and I'm going to hold these two up here. So one choice when fertilizing your tomatoes is, and we've all heard of, is something like miracle Grow, And it's not the only one, but the point is it's chemical. Um, it's derived out of a factory. Um, it's, um, it's got the nitrogen and the phosphorus and potassium, which I'm going to go over in another slide. But those are your three major macronutrients that you need for plants. Um, but it comes from a chemical source. And if you read the, the directions, you've got to apply it every one to two weeks. You can get products that are in granular form. And I've got some up here as examples. Same issue. They're chemicals that you're putting in the soil. Um, and I'll tell you another important difference when I talk about this. Um, so here's another product, especially when it comes to tomatoes. And it doesn't have to have a picture of a tomato on there. Um, what's unique about it is when you read the direction, or I mean, what it's actually made out of, what you're looking for is that it's got a percentage of calcium in it. Um, the calcium will prevent your tomatoes at, you know, once they're getting ready to ripen, it'll prevent them from splitting and it'll prevent them from what they call blossom end rot, um, where the bottom of the tomato just starts turning black or, or rotting. Um, and it's all contributed all because it just doesn't have enough calcium. Um, so when you're feeding your tomatoes, which I recommend doing on average once a month, so if these instructions say just do it once every three months, cut your amount that you're fertilizing it and just keep feeding it monthly to keep your plant healthy and, and going um, you know, throughout the growing season. Um, the other important thing about using organic products like this, and this is not the only one, there's a lot on the shelf. I've got another product here, um, we have, which is created by Job's. I've got here this Alaska fish fertilizer. Um, and here's another important consideration to look at. I'm gonna actually um, see if we can find the numbers on here as well. Good point. Um, yeah, so bone, bone meal has calcium in it. Um, and most of these actually do have calcium. I mean, bone meal that is where they're driving their calcium. This here has 7%. So they're, they're marking the fact that for tomatoes, and they're putting, I think 7 is one of the highest I've seen. Um, this fish fertilizer on the other, and the other thing I want to point out is the numbers. So this here on the back, if you take a look at the numbers, I usually like getting a product that's actually even. And if it's not even, I might supplement it with something else. But on the back, it says 274. So the 2 is your nitrogen. The 7 is your phosphorus. And the 4 is your potassium. So 2 is your 2% of this product has nitrogen in it, which will make your plants grow and turn green and do all these good things for your plant. But only 2%. This one over here has a 511 on it, so it's 5%. But then when it comes to um, your phosphorus, which this has a 7, now you got 7% phosphorus compared to this only has a 1. So if you're using fish fertilizer to care for your tomatoes throughout the growing season, it's, you're not giving it much when it comes to the fruiting. And phosphorus actually targets specifically the flowers and the fruiting. Um, and the last one is potassium. And the last one is potassium. On this one, it has a 4. And this one here has a one. And potassium is good for disease resistance um, as well as um, uh, you know, creating a stronger root system as well for the plant. Um, so again, this here is low. But if you just want your plants to grow and you want to give them a fresh start, um, you'd use something like a fish fertilizer here. Here's another product created by Job's. Here's another one called Neptune's Harvest. And this has 2% nitrogen, 3% phosphate and 1% potash and derived from, and I wanted, it's in the slide, so we're going to brush over some of these slides, I'm just talking, is um, derived from hydrolyzed fish compared to fish emulsion. Um, the expert gardeners say it's better to use hydrolyzed fish. The difference being is they take the entire fish, bones and all, and, and proteins and everything, and use that to create the product. It's considered a superior product being it's got more nutrients and more, I mean, it's got all of the minerals. Um, and we're going to look at the periodic chart and towards the end, but it just has more parts in it. If you take a look at your bodies and all the vitamins that we put in, but forget about the vitamins, just the foods that we eat, if we're eating nutritionally, should have a lot of good elements in our body. Um, if you're only putting nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium on your plants, it's not enough, I'm telling you from now. It's 
you got your macronutrients, but you're not giving it the complete balance, which again, an organic fertilizer will have more of that um, in it. Yes? Question. What about, so let's put fertilizers and spraying them on the leaves versus the granule around the leaves? So, um, so John mentioned, if, what if we spray it with a liquid fertilizer on the leaves and actually feed it that way? You're talking about this one here? This is actually, um, it's specific for actually, um, for transplant shock. It's vitamin B1. Um, but um, if you have a product that actually um, allows you to do it as a foliar spray, which again, I don't really encourage doing it this way. Um, but if, you, if this product actually, you could do just that. That's okay. Um, so a fish fertilizer, you can do that, but I would say dilute it a lot. Like, but plants do eat and can eat through their leaf. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about fertilizing with salts, which we, I'm going to get to at the end. Um, and that's actually a really good way to actually turn your plants green. Um, the other thing with tomatoes, and I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to do a quick demo of planting your tomatoes, since we've got so many tomatoes and all of you are going to go home and plant it, I want to show you guys how we're going to actually get them in the ground. The first thing I like to do, and for those of you that know me, when I touch dirt, I like to put on my gloves. So we're going to do that real quick. The spikes? If they're organic, I know Job's makes organic spikes, the answer is yes. Yeah. Um, but again, I like to feed at least every month. I mean, your plant's going to give you, and you got to give back, and, um, and it's a good balance that way. So what I'm going to do here is, and I'm going to talk about a couple of soils real quick. Um, and I know some of you in the back don't see this, but you've gone to the store and you've um, picked up potting soil, and then other times you might decide, do I get an amend, or do I get a um, compost bag, or like, do I get steer manure, or like, what do I get my hands on? Um, and there was a person in front of me in line at the nursery this last week or two, and they're advertising miracle Grow three bags for $10, and they're taking it all, and they had this whole flat of vegetables, and I'm like, and it, it said potting soil on there. And I'm like, are they going to plant all of those vegetables? They had about 100 vegetables all in, all in pots, or are they going to put that potting soil in the soil? Um, there's another slide, and when I hit it, I'm, we're just going to talk about it. I'm going to remind you about what we just said. But potting soil is pretty much consistent of three things. Um, this here is like a bag of vermiculite, um, and it pretty much, I'll show you afterwards for anybody who wants to see it. I don't know if you can see this. I'll kind of like let it fall, but it's, um, it's kind of like goldish. It comes like from volcanic rock, and then they pop it like popcorn, and it's as light as snow. Um, it's awesome for if you're going to seed anything, um, and I have a demonstration I'll, I'll show you. This is actually really good to like seed on top of like tomato seeds or anything like small and fine. This is a good product to use. Um, in potting soil, so aside from vermiculite, there's then perlite. And perlite is this white snow. Um, and all this does is actually allow water to penetrate through. This does not absorb water. So it's kind of the opposite of what vermiculite does. Vermiculite actually holds water and, and pulls it up. The last thing in a potty mix that you'd need if you were to put it together, and these are all in equal parts. If you took one cup, one cup, one cup, you would have three parts equal of these that would then make up your, your potty mix. And the last thing here is peat moss. We all know what peat moss is, so here it is. This here is the only part, if you were to make your own potting soil, that's actually, um, I'm not using the word organic in the sense of saying it was derived from an organic source, but it's the only part that's actually living and will actually decay. And if you actually take like a handful of soil, which I recommend doing, even if you're potting a plant, um, to get some of the soil organisms, the nematodes, the bacteria, the, um, the worms, and get them to actually live in the soil. Um, but they'll actually feed on the, peep, the, the moss that's in there. They'll feed on, when you fertilize it, these products um, that are organic that you put in the soil, which the inorganic products, like miracle Grow, um, won't do for your plants. If you're just dumping you know, blue miracle Grow into your soil, that's not feeding the life that's in the soil. So you gotta think about your soil as being, and it is, a, a living thing that's actually supporting. I mean, there's, there's millions of organisms in there that are actually working with your plant to maintain a healthy balance to create healthy, um, healthy trees. 
So for this purpose, I'm not going to leave it in a pot. I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. But I'm actually going to reach into um, this grow mulch bag, which is pretty much composed of um, compost like from forest floors, as well as it's got um, like poultry manure and, um, and cow manure and, and, and a few other products in here as well. But I'm just going to take that and put one scoop here at the bottom. And I'm going to grab my tomato real quick. And I took the tallest one to make a point. Tomatoes, more so than any other plant, um, like I'm thinking about squash, you wouldn't do this too. I mean, can you think of, an, I mean, I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to do it. Tomatoes, you actually want to plant as deep as you can. You just want to leave the last few leaves at the top um, once you get it in the ground. Um, but I can't think of another vegetable that you'd want to plant that deep. But the deeper you go with the tomato, the whole trunk will actually form roots. It'll increase the stability of the plant. Um, and it'll actually be a better um, productive plant. What you'll notice also if you've done this before is most people plant the whole thing with the leaves underground. Um, and the reason to avoid that is the leaves will start rotting under the ground. It would be the equivalent of putting your arms in soil, then your arms are rotting, and that's not going to be good for the center of me that my, you know, that there's rotting parts on me. Um, so what I like to do is actually remove it. If you want to put them back in the soil, I encourage that you just put them on top and allow it to naturally decay back into the soil. But do not put this into the soil and we'll get to the point where if you've got like compost on your property to not put non-mature compost deep into the soil you just want to use it use it on the surface if you're if you're using compost that's not finished because this will suck the oxygen out of the soil whereas the roots do need oxygen and that's why I mean this is not a finished compost whereas this product is um, so we're going to take our tomato I just removed all the leaves to about as, you know, leaving the last few on the top. There's one more here on the side I'll pluck off. And then we're just going to pull it out of the container. And if the roots have coiled, because I've just transplanted these about two weeks ago, the roots are still working its way down, but it did work its way all the way through. Um, and now we're just going to go as deep as I can. And then we're going to fill the rest up with soil, like so. Um, so my roots didn't coil, I, I, like, but if they were coiled, it's actually of more value to rip those bottom quarter inch of roots that have grown in a circle than if you just left it. If you just leave it, that plant for the rest of the year, if you're going to keep it for a year or if it's a tree, when we pull that out, if there's any coils in it, if you leave it there, many trees actually die when they actually pull them out of the ground 20 years, 50 years later. That coil will still be there and the roots will just strangle the whole tree. The nutrients, the food, the whole life of the tree just doesn't flow anymore, all because of just the roots. You want to make sure that they're actually fanning out, you know, creating a good, good stable um, area. So, so this plant is now in. You can see it's deeper now than it was before. Um, and then we're going to water it. And I usually like watering it with something like a vitamin like a vitamin B1 um, solution or Super Thrive is another one that I've used to kind of help your plants once you get them in the ground. There's one more thing I'm going to do before I'm done with this, which is, if I can find it here. Got this and this and this. Yes. Yes. Um, so the question was, if you were to plant your tomatoes in a pot, would you use a potting soil? And the answer is absolutely yes. And do not use garden soil, I mean, your, your native soil around your property, um, with the exception of this. When you actually do um, put your potting plant together, do take at least a handful of soil from your ground just to get those organisms that are living in your soil into that pot. These products, even though they're in bags and the product looks good, has very little life in it. It's not the same as the compost that would come out of your garden where it's loaded with worms and loaded with nematodes and loaded with bacteria and loaded with all these good things that will actually go in your soil and actually benefit your plants immediately. As these organisms are eating all of these organic products, whether it's 
the fish fertilizer or you know the jobs you know that's usually made out of feathers and bones and all these other things those soil organisms are eating it and leaving waste behind that every time you water your plants and especially I want to go back to the tomato if I've got a sprinkler system on it and we know the importance of not getting your leaves wet um, which leads me to another point I'm gonna say it also real quick when you water your vegetables from now and through the end of the year it's good to actually get um, if it's gonna if you've got it on a timer to do them in the morning so with whether it's your vegetables or your fruit trees or any other trees, you don't want their leaves to be wet usually overnight. Um, some gardeners will tell you it's important to water at night just because the plants will stay wet longer and it helps. Um, so as long as you're aware of what you're doing, I wouldn't recommend, especially for your tomato plants, to actually keep them wet at night. Um, that does contribute to the funguses and the molds that actually could kill. Even in the summertime. In the summer, just if you can get your timers on like at four or five in the morning, we'll wait a second for the plane to pass. So, um, yeah, so watering, even in the summertime, if you can just set your timers at like four in the morning, will be better than watering at eight o'clock at night so that the water doesn't sit on the plant all night long. Um, and then going back to sprinklers again, if you spray it on, the entire soil, and assuming this is in the ground, is going to be wet and feeding all of the soil organisms and keeping them alive because they too need water. But if you've got a drip and the soil is very porous and the water is going to travel through real fast, if I have a drip right here on this side of the tomatoes, this side of the tomatoes is the only side that's getting wet. This whole side's still dry. I've seen a lot of gardens fail just because the whole root zone was not wet. So I've actually switched and I've tried them all, but I, I believe in actually putting a spray system around your vegetables to get the best results over the spring and summer. Um, the next thing I'm going to share with you, and some of you have seen all this paint that I brought with me, um, and I have to thank you guys for this, but you guys have inspired me to create a product. Um, and this here is um, Ivy Organics. It's basically a three-in-one tree guard paint that is all organic. Um, I'm going to use it on the tomato plant but its most important use is actually when we get to the citrus and the avocados and the other trees. Um, and I know the more and more people I talk to, and even the people that know plants a lot, um, don't take burn into consideration. They're like, how can too much sun actually harm a plant? Um, but the farmers, and there's actually a farmer I'm working with right now in Florida, he has an avocado orchard. And he says every summer he, he cuts his avocados like in half. And he says that brings in so much light into the center of the tree that it burns it. Um, I have an example I'm going to show you real quick. If you can pick up that cup and I'm going to show you this. And I don't know how well this is going to show um, to you in the back. But does anybody see the burn that's on this tree? So I just bought this, but I'm going to return it because it's not a healthy tree despite how happy it looks on the top. But this plant, once I plant it in the ground, could die in a matter of a year or two. It's got a horrible start. If you take a look over here, it's all brown all the way up. If you take a look around the base of the trunk, it's like black all the way around and all from burn. It's like not just black, it's also cracked severely around the base. So once the bark is actually damaged, once the bark is damaged, the living tissue is right underneath it. So now you got the beetles and the termites, which we just saw flying around, that will work the way now into the center wood of the tree, which is not the living part of the tree. The life of the tree is on the outside, just underneath the surface of the bark. So um, the fact that I, like the rest of the farmers in this world, would use something like paint to basically protect my trees. And if you come into my backyard, it's all but my newest tree that I've yet to do this to. Um, but they're all painted. I basically paint the tree trunks and I paint the branches. Um, and then most recently I learned from someone, and that's what I'm gonna do here to the tomato, is I can take I'm going to stir this up real quick. So this is, and I'm going to open another can in just a minute. This one actually, um, this one actually prepared at home before I came, but I'm going to open another can. But what it is when I open one of these empty ones is it, it's a dry paint powder because it is organic. Once you add water, just like organic things, it decays. It doesn't last forever. Um, 
So it's an organic paint powder, and then it's got also neem oil, which everybody knows in the garden you use neem to basically repel, um, to repel pests. And then there's um, castor oil, which um, usually it's applied as a broadcast over your lawn and over your garden to so basically get the moles and the voles and the squirrels out of your garden because it makes everything taste bad. But all of that, all of that is in this paint. So I basically take this paint now, and this is another application, is you can take a teaspoon um, or two per gallon. I'm just going to put a few drops of it here in this water and put the spray on top. And what I've just created, you can see how it just turned like, like basically milky white. And now I'm just going to spray the top of this plant. And now I just created some, basically a sunblock for plants, which is only ideal at the time of planting. Like now, usually when you put your plants in the ground, they usually wilt. But now I've got a plant that's got sunblock on it. So it will tolerate, it's dilute enough, the light's still getting in. Um, there's a couple people putting it on orchards right now, but you don't want to do it more than two times a year. Like your goal is the plant still needs light, but this just keeps it cooler by doing something like this. Um, and I'm going to skip the watering step, but you got to water this as well. Um, we'll do it at the end. So that's that. We just did about six or seven slides just now, believe it or not. Are there any questions yet? Yes. So with the, we had an avocado tree and it burned up. Yeah. And we thought that we had to provide like a filter shade for it. This, this product is, is great. So you spray the entire tree in the, before summer, like when it gets really, really hot. So and then you're good for until. I don't want to, I'm not going to do it to this tree, but you're going to see what I'm going to do to that tree because I'm actually, I, I prepared this for someone that's, um, I thought was going to be here, but it's still going to go to her. Um, but I prepared it um, in anticipation um, of her being here. But this avocado I'm not going to spray, but what I would do to it if I were to plant it or pot it or whatever I was going to do is the first thing I was going to do, and we're going to practice it on this tree, is paint the whole trunk. And then I would make this dilute spray, and I would spray the entire top. And that will basically protect it for the whole year. And then you and just... High des or low desert area, a little hotter than you are here. It doesn't matter where you are. Hotter, yeah, it doesn't matter where you are. Then again, that's the importance of this. We just got a call. It was actually one of my retailers emailed me. Um, saying this person in Dubai, 50 degrees Celsius. I don't know the conversion, but I know it's hot. Um, but he's like, I need this product for my fruit trees. But he's, he's got, what is 50? Does anybody know? 130 degrees, somebody said. So he's using it. Can you imagine like you're, this poor tree in 130 degrees? But if it was protected properly, you could do it. When you pick up your trees from the nursery, many times, and I'm shocked this one doesn't have it, but they're usually painted white. But they're painted white with paint and if you take a, and the reason I brought all of these cans of paint if you want to see them afterwards but every single can I picked up in my garage and I even got my spray can too but they all say warning known to the state of California to have a chemical that causes birth defects and um, and cancer and it's like how can you possibly put it on your trees and if you take a look you'll even find especially on fruit trees they'll even spray the leaves with this stuff which are just going to fall back in your garden and now it's in your soil and now it's with all the microorganisms that are living there it just seems wrong, like, and that was kind of the inspiration behind this product is to basically use an organic paint, organic neem oil, organic castor oil, and that's all that's in there. Um, and it was a product I've been working on for years, but I just patented it last year. It's finally in distribution. It made it at HomeDepot.com um, about two weeks ago, and, uh, and it's going. Thank you. Um, and actually, my offer to you guys, if there's anybody interested, um, to kind of expedite the review process, because it could take a year to get reviews, I'm offering a free can to anybody that's interested if you see me afterwards. If you could just give me a review when you buy the product. Um, so that's my ask and that's my pitch for today. Yeah. And that's it. What this will do now that I, that, that I protected it is I'm helping it with the initial planting. I'm helping it avoid the transplant shock. I'm helping it if it were a full, um, full grown tree. I'm helping it. Um, you know, avoid the desiccation, which is usually what it does when you plant, it goes in a shock and it usually dries out. But this will actually keep your plant cool, especially you want to plant in spring, but we get some spring days like today that's kind of too hot. Um, you know, if you were doing plantings, you'd wish it was in the 60s and 70s to keep it cool that first week. But that's what this product will do is keep it cool while it's getting established. It'll keep the plant light while it's making its next flush of growth. So that's what that does. Yeah. 
Yes. Isn't that the same thing? I've seen it. Um, it's a spray, um, and I know it goes like for indoor outdoor, um, and it is a spray, right, for um, for wilting. This product was originally designed specifically for painting tree trunks and branches, and the additional application of like doing the sunblock is a, is just a side thing. Um, if you actually even take a look at the directions, it says do not paint it on on your leaves because it is too thick with the way it is. But to dilute it like this, and being that it's organic, you can still use it. No. To keep it cooler, absolutely, it would it would help. But I'd like to see it too. I mean, we're close enough. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions before I go to the next one? Yeah. So how do I'll I come to you, Martha. Getting a thousand cases of that product. <laughs> how do you what? <laughs> They're sold individually. You put me up to that. You're so you funny. <laughs> I'm not, I know what you're leading to. Um, I don't have a thousand cans of this stuff. Is what he's asking. Is what he's trying to get me to say. At least not yet. Um, Martha. I just had a question about some of the chickens had milkweed and thinking about I got some last year that grew and then kind of died back in the winter. Yeah. Do you cut them? Do you replant them? Mine are still coming back now, but not very well. So last year when Shilly Irani actually um, hosted our garden club, I actually had three different colors. I had a pink and a yellow, and then this one over here, which is considered the tropical or the wild milkweed. Um, this one made it or didn't make it? It's the only one also, like I've seen it on a few other properties, it's the only one that stays green throughout the um, winter. Um, the other ones, both of them, I had the two other colors, they died in the fall, like completely. I thought they're, they're crunchy and gone. They both came back just a few weeks ago. Um, so like that root ball was still alive, even the whole top was toast. Um, so they do come back and it did say like they'll die and come back and usually once you plant milkweed, it's there forever. Um, in my garden, yeah, you can actually bring it down to like the lowest foot or two, and then and then it'll 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 regrow. But yeah, you, it, it, I do recommend you bring it back just so it's a stronger plant. Yeah. Was there another question? We're good. Um, so we talked about potting mixes, topsoils, amend, compost. You guys all understand the difference of you don't want to put. And I'm gonna. I just love repeating this: is you don't want to put potting mix in your soil. And again, the reason for avoiding that is um, peat moss, which it says retains moisture. You don't want your soil being too wet. Um, once you wet your soil, you want it to dry. Like that's actually makes your plants healthier that are actually planted in the ground. But for a pot, especially through the summer, you might have to water it every single day to keep it going. And what your potting mix will do is actually retain the water to keep your plants going. Um, so use potting mix if you're planting in a pot. Don't use other soils if you're planting in a pot. Like you do need a potting mix or make your own using those three ingredients we discussed earlier. Um, and use compost, use manure carefully. Um, it's too high in nitrogen. You want something that's more balanced. And so if you get an amend or a compost or something else that's got a lot of ingredients in there aside from just manure, will actually create a healthier soil for your plants. Um, If you so, if I were putting this in, in, in my gr ground, um, which is where I you know is how I typically grow them, um, this year just says grow mulch, two in one planting mix. Another one I've seen by Kellogg is Amend, is another good one. I think my, my preferred choice would be Amend, um, and then you can even get those two and three dollar bags that just say compost or whatever else, and you can just get smaller bags as well. Kellogg's came out with a new product this year called Garden Soil. But it's all, it's still made out of compost ingredients. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, that's another um, thing. So now we're going to go to transplanting and potting trees. Um, got a clear little area here. Yes. Yeah. I get it. That's an excellent question. Um, so she has a raised planting bed. It's basically, it's, you know, I'm here on, on, the, on the soil. 
she basically raised an area and grows her vegetables up here. Um, the, the significance of actually having a raised bed is the, um, the water just comes down a lot faster. All of the soil that was in there, and I remember when you created it, it all came from bags like these. It was all brought in. It's got very little to no clay in it. Um, aside from being born and raised here, I spent eight years in Florida where you, you live in sand, like everything's sand. Um, and the farmers there like wish they had clay, believe it or not. Um, like you, like coming back now from having lived in Florida, I love my clay and I actually amend it with sand and compost and, and, and bring it back to life and loosen it. Um, but what clay actually does for your soil and maybe it would be worthwhile to bring some of the clay into your potting bed, um, is that it actually does help retain moisture. Um, it helps hold the nutrients. Um, it does all of these benefits um, to soil that um, the farmers in Florida don't have. Um, they actually do buy clay and bring it over, whereas over here we're like, we wish we had no clay. Um, but you, got, you, you, you can actually improve your soil and, and having clay is actually wonderful for trees. California is the, you know, the, the vegetable and fruit belt of the world. So, and we all live on clay soil, I mean, pretty much throughout the entire state. Yeah, just put some of that in there. I think it would help. Um, it wouldn't hurt to actually maybe have some potting mix in your raised bed um, to maybe retain more moisture if that's the issue. But I know I think you have a drip system in your bed, if I remember right. And I think doing more of a sprinkler system would do better for you than that. So something to consider. Yes. A blended pot. Yeah. <laughs> Like, don't just use potting soil. Like, I would, I would actually, if it were mine, I would integrate the two. I would do both. And then watch it. I mean, what potting soil does, if you actually just put it in your garden, is it's going to make that spot rot, pretty much. It's going to be so wet and damp, you're going to get moss growing on it, and those are not the things you want growing around your fruit trees and your vegetables. Um, but, you know, that's just something to consider. Um, the next thing we're going to do here is, um, is actually planting a tree. I'm hoping some of you, and actually we've got on your list, and we'll get to those shortly. Um, aside from the trees that I brought in, the tomatoes and the um, milkweeds, and I'm going to talk about milkweed for a second before I get to the pot now, um, is, is, our, is our trees. Um, we've got a lot of trees here. I've also got, I don't know if any of you know what plumeria are. So I actually, um, with a property I was working on out in, took my wife with me to Baldwin Park. So when that, like there, um, pretty much every other house has these plumeria trees in the front of their property. Like we don't see them as much here. Um, but over there, it's like, it seems to be like, you know, this, the, the, city, the city tree. Um, I knew one of the neighbors and he actually gave me about, I would say 20 cuttings. Um, and if I was at one of the nurseries yesterday and, and they were starting to sell them, they range in price just for a little stick like that, about $17 to as much as $34 to $35 for, for one little piece. Um, this is, um, there's someone I met that tried growing it in the fall, um, but the best time to actually be cutting plumeria is right now in the spring. Um, so if you're going to do plumeria, um, I got all these cuttings and they bloom. They're actually in your program. If you go to the very end, I put a little picture. So you, if you didn't know what it was, it's basically in Hawaii, they usually use them to make the lays. Um, Someone here yesterday said um, the smell at night, and I did some more research on it, and it says it's at night is actually when the tree releases its, its fragrance to attract the moths and the other insects. Um, so it, it, it would be a beautiful accent to hopefully a lot of our homes here in the Hollywood Hills. Um, so, um, so I'm hoping we're going to see a lot of plumeria and put them in the front yard so I can see them too. <laughs> um, so now we're going to get to potting. I'm going to teach you a few tricks about um, potting. Um, the first one is, is this. So I got this pot from, again, local nursery. I want to see how we're doing on time. We're doing okay. So here's a pot I got from the nursery. Um, made out of plastic. The preferred pot, if you're going to use a pot, is clay. Um, because it does hold moisture and it helps the plant. They said overall with health. Clay is the way to go. This here is a plastic container. Um, no matter what container I use, I always like, and this is something I've been doing for a couple of years now, is putting um, little marbles or something at the base. And for me, it's always been marbles. And so I've got these like, little green marbles that I'll actually tack on the bottom and, and, and glue them on. And over here, I've got like some liquid nails. 
Um, I'm not going to do it now just because I'm going to have to move this afterwards. But what I would do is take four dabs of liquid nails on the corners and just put um, these marbles. And what it does for your property, actually, not so much for the tree, is it prevents any stains on your concrete decks. Um, and especially here where there's like wood, um, we don't want to attract termites and stuff with all the moisture in the wood. So um, they're here. They're, they already are here. Um, so what this does is it actually just gets it off the, uh, off the ground. Um, the other thing too is if you're using a pot is to make sure you actually have drain holes at the bottom. Um, for the same reason we keep talking about you don't want to drown the plants. The roots do need oxygen. Um, we talked about putting non-mature compost in the soil and how that actually robs the soil of the oxygen. Um, so you want to use mature compost. You want to put holes. You want to make sure that there's air you know, that circulates. And the insects are what's going to improve the soil. You've got worms in there. They're going to dig their tunnels. Plants are going to be super happy. Um, so what we're going to do here, since it's in a pot, so I skipped a couple of steps. I'm not putting on my marbles and I'm not putting in the holes, um, at least not yet. But here we go. What I'm going to do is I'm taking my potty mix. I'm going to add a couple of inches of soil. And typically, if you've got potted plants and you're going from one pot to the next, like sometimes they graduate in size, um, you typically don't want to take your plant from a small pot and put it in a supersized pot. Usually your change between pot sizes should be about a couple of inches. The goal is you want the roots to get into the soil quickly um, and to basically fill in that area to prevent any of the soil from rotting. Um, but once the soil has actually reached their way into all of that soil, um, you've actually created a healthier environment for the plant in the pot. So I just added my potty mix at the bottom. What I'm going to do next and it's so weird, with every step, there's so many lessons to be taught. Um, so I just got this tree from the nursery. Um, what you'll notice here is that there's a metal stake here. It's tied by some plastic bandage here and down here. Um, the first thing you want to do, actually, when you get your tree from the nursery is actually remove the stake. The stake is there pretty much to hold the tree straight and to make it present nicely until, until you buy it. Um, but these stakes, if you leave them on, and I've seen people put them in the ground, and like four years later, the tree is just being strangled by the way it was, um, the way it was put in place. We're actually going to stake it at the end so I can show you what it should look like when you're done. So I'm just removing the plastic, the plastic ties that are around it. Here's the other one. What kind of citrus is this? So this here, this gift, is um, a blood orange tree. Yeah. Um, and what's unique about the blood orange trees, this specifically is Moro blood orange. What's unique about the blood oranges is they've got a very dark red in interior and it's got um, a lot of like anti-cancer more so than just a regular orange um, properties because of the color. Um, so that's that part of it. There's a couple of weeds around the plant as well. We're going to pull those out, put these here on the side. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do before I actually put it in the pot, I'm going to make some more room here. As you can see the height that's on here, we have to make a decision. Are we going to want this to grow? And this here is a semi-dwarf. I purposely got it as a semi-dwarf for two purposes. Um, one, I knew it was going to go in a pot, but I didn't want it to stay too low. Sometimes you see these potted fruit trees and it's just a few feet over the top and it looks a little wimpy and it's not you know doing much or performing well um, you don't want to go with a standard tree because you're forcing this giant tree to live in a small space and the tree will reward you or not reward you with very little fruit very little to no fruit this here being a semi-dwarf I figured was the compromise between I want the trees vigor it's grafted right here and we already talked about how grafting works you can pick the rootstock and here they pick a semi-dwarf rootstock which will put the tree somewhere between I'll actually read the label here. It says eight and 10 feet. Being in a pot, it'll probably be closer to five and six feet. Um, and then we can always control the height by pruning it. This is, if you never cut it, it would be eight to 10 feet tall. If it was on a standard root stock, it'd be 15 to 25 feet tall. Exactly the same tree, same quality of fruit, same size fruit, but it's just a root that controls. What I want to do with this tree is I want to keep it all near the base of the pot, and I can make this pot now that I've got some room. I want it to be in this zone over here. I've got some good roots. It's a semi-dwarf tree. 
and it'll you know try to grow a foot or two every single year and then I'll shape it how I want but it'll always be right around this pot zone and I'll maintain a canopy that way but what I'm gonna do here is just because that's my goal and not shape it into a tree is I'm actually gonna remove the height of it and keep these side branches that'll actually create the canopy around the pot um, on the contrary if my goal was to create a tall tree I would remove all of these branches on the side citrus is another very well-known plant for actually being sensitive to sun um, so again as much as plants love sun um, there was a tree I actually pruned for someone and I told them and they didn't do it um, but we cut almost 50 percent of the height like it was growing on the house and it was growing um, in various directions so we contained it it was never pruned in its entire life um, so we shaped it we got the desired shape within a week or two the entire side of the tree that was now exposed to sunlight burnt um, and, and I can show you some more if you have, like, like afterwards, I can, I can show you what it looks like. Um, I took some pictures, but the whole side of the tree that was exposed to sun, and it's usually only one side of the tree, like here, now the sun's over here, this side of the tree would burn, this side of the tree will maintain the life of the tree. But I've now just opened a wound that'll probably be there for the life of the tree. Um, whereas had it been coated, it would have been healthy all the way around, it would have probably lived a longer and healthier life. Um, so now that we discussed that, what I'm gonna do here and again, if it were a taller tree, it would be more important to actually then coat the sides with a paint. But being that it's a bush, we're actually going to bring it down to here. Ooh. But do you oh, that Yeah, so, so somebody wants the cutting. Yeah, you can have the cutting and have blood oranges. But if you plant this in your garden, what will it turn into? A dwarf, a semi-dwarf, or a standard-sized tree? Any guesses? Probably standard. Yeah, so everybody knows the answer. It's standard. It'll grow into a standard tree. Um, so, so that's this. This is the original parent plant. Like everything actually starts with a parent. So someone found, you know, you know, planted, where's my grapefruit? So someone along the way planted seeds and decided I'm going to take my chances and plant a seed and got this amazing fruit that the world wanted, which is, here's an example, the moral blood orange. Um, and it was such a success that from there they started taking cuttings off of it and grafting it. But the original parent plant, if this were planted, it would be sitting on its own roots and it's its own plant. Like it's not grafted and it'll grow to whatever size its original parent grew to, which most citrus grow um, to about 15 and some grow up to 30 feet. Um, yeah. This is not the season for grafting, right? That's the fall? I actually graft year round. <laughs> but uh, that, like, I can do hours on just grafting. <laughs> There's, there's methods that you can actually do grafting at any, t any time of, of the year. Um, and the least favorite for me is winter just because there's no life. I mean, if you were to graft, it would be early spring. Um, I could do summer, fall, you know, almost, almost any time year round. So going back to um, the fruit, yeah. So once you, once you have the desired fruit, you just basically cut off of it and, and, and continue making um, the plants. So I'll actually put this guy, and it's got a label on it, over here if anybody wants to take this cutting and give it a shot. So now we're going to take this plant, we're going to pick it up, we're going to inspect the root ball. Let's take a look at the bottom. Do we see any coiling? No. no. So all we're going to do here is we're going to try to wake up the plant. So we're going to try to like loosen the soil around, around the base to let it know it's no longer in the pot. You can actually scratch it with a, um, you know, a hand tool. I'm just going to use my fingers here a little bit just to loosen it up and then we set it in the pot. When you plant, and we talked about tomatoes, that you plant tomatoes deep, most plants do not like being planted any deeper than the condition in which it came. Um, so in this case, the root ball is right here and it's going to stay exactly that. It'll be just about a quarter inch, a half an inch below the surface of the um, container. But you do not, if you actually cover this with an additional inch or two of soil, you're actually suffocating the plant. Um, so you want to keep it so that the same roots that are on the top that are getting the oxygen. And remember the top two feet are like really the life supporting parts of the plant. Um, so we're going to, we're going to keep it right there. This plant will stay in this pot for at least five years. Um, between five, and it's actually in there, somewhere between about four to five, maybe six years, you should move it to another container. Um, even if it stays in the same container, if you can just remove the bottom two to three inches of soil, give it another nice haircut, like to balance any roots that you've just damaged, 
um, and then you can put it right back in the same container. But you just want to keep it, um, you know, thriving and, and you know, and, and working towards growth and not being stagnant in the same pot. Um, the fruits on this tree should happen within, the, um, within a year, two years tops. Being a grafted tree, um, that's a good question. I'm actually going to pull that branch up real quick. Let me finish this real quick. Um, so I'm actually compressing the soil around the plant. You do want to make sure that there's no air pockets around the root ball because that too can dry the roots out. So you want to make sure all the roots are in contact with soil and that's the reason I'm running my fingers around it. What's that? And then I've got my water bucket. Where was it? It was right here. I didn't use the grow mulch because it's staying in a, in, a, um, in a pot. So I use potting soil only. I wanted something that's going to hold the water so I don't have to um, water it as frequently. So um, I used it for the tomato to give you an example of what it's going to be like when I put it in the ground. I just use it for a contrast. Um, and then I just added vitamin B1, um, which helps with transplant shock, to a gallon of water. And now I'm just going to water around the base. But I'm not going to put too much water. I'm just showing for demonstration purposes. I would water it. Um, you don't want to fertilize it on the first day that you just planted it. Um, if you're going to try to get some soil in the base of the tree, you can actually add some fertilizer there, but you don't want to fertilize it much for at least the next three to six weeks. And then you can start feeding it every month thereafter. Um, always read the directions of your product. I always like cutting back on the directions so I can keep on caring for my plants every month when I'm in the garden. Um, so we've just done that. Now we're going to take our paint product and get the brush. And this is where the value comes in, is we're now going to coat the tree trunk so it doesn't burn. The vulnerability would be more so if we, if we shape it into a tree and if more of the trunk was exposed. I'm just doing this as preventative only. Um, it probably doesn't need it. If there's actually right here, there was like um, a cut. I notice on a lot of trees that are cut, and I'll tell you, um, most of the gardeners, most of the gardeners are actually saying, you do not want to seal. And we had a professional actually at our last garden class meeting that said, you don't need to seal wounds. Like when you, when you prune a tree, just let it, let it, let it close naturally. Um, but go to like the Los Angeles Zoo, where I got a lot of pictures like to show the differences. Um, or anywhere else, when you see like pruning, you'll sometimes see that they'll close cleanly and there'll be no damage behind the wood. But take a look at how many trees that the termites and the beetles already made their way in. And then now it's going to close. And I've seen a lot of trees in our community where the whole inside of the tree is rotting out. And it all happened from, from, from one, 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 prune being, um, one limb being pruned. So again, by coating it, um, beetles and termites are not going to want to go through this paint that's now got neem oil and castor oil and, and your rodents. So we've got a lot of rodents in this community. And I lost a lemon tree I planted. Um, it was about this size when I planted it. And within two years, I had over 100 lemons. It was 15 feet tall. Um, and then and that was another inspiration behind the product. It actually chewed. It was a mole that chewed all the way around the base of the, uh, base of the plant, um, a mole or a vole. So one of those rodents in it, in it, in it that, I, you know, that I had in my garden. And within a matter of weeks, all the leaves turned yellow um, and started you know, drooping. I thought about grafting it from the side and trying to save it. But then it's starting to look like a Frankenstein tree. I'm like, I quit um, and, and, and put something else in its place. But then now I've got this product basically on all of my trees in my backyard. Um, and you'll see some even in my front yard. So that's it. This is done. I've got some decorative rocks um, to put around it. If you're going to compost um, on it as well, the, the trick is to make sure that nothing's touching the tree trunk. Um, even if you're using like bark or, or any other things, you don't want to touch in the bark so it doesn't rot against the tree. You want it to stay away um, and just keep the soil near it. So that's our lesson on potting and planting trees. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. You put, uh, we'll go John first, yeah. I was just curious. You, I generally put rocks in the bottom of my truck. Yes. And they also drain holes. Are you saying if you've got the drain holes, you don't need the rocks on the bottom? So, um, yeah. So the question was, if you have a pot, do you, do you recommend putting like rocks at the bottom? Um, I have on some plants put rocks. I put wood chips. The concern with putting wood chips at the bottom of your plant is that wood actually pulls the nitrogen um, out of the soil. Um, so it's usually not. 
Yeah, but what's um, what you do want to do is once you have the drain holes is to typically block it with um, maybe like broken ceramic, clay pots, rocks, um, any of those things. But the main reason behind that is to make sure that the water can actually pass through and the soil doesn't block those holes. But that's that's one of the main reasons for actually having that in place. Um, Elizabeth. Okay, let me pull it up. So the question was this. Um, she wants to root this. Um, I'm actually going to prepare it now. And I'm actually going to go to my lesson on plumerias as well. I brought with me a rooting powder here, which if anybody grabs their hands on the plumeria, feel free to dip it. Um, and you can take it with you. Um, but what rooting powder does is it basically stimulates the, the plant to actually make roots. You only need to get it near the, near the base, like bottom half inch um, or inch up the, up the plant. Um, but more important than anything is when you have a cutting is you don't want it to rot. Um, and that's something else that this product does too, is, is you're basically preventing the cut from rotting um, while, while, it's, while it's trying to root. If I were to prepare this now as a cutting to answer Elizabeth's question is, um, I'm actually gonna cut it one more time. So now we're gonna have two pieces for someone. Um, so I'm taking this. This is all new growth and it's really weak and it's not gonna, like as soon as I do anything, it's gonna dry out. So I'm actually gonna take off the newest growth. I'm gonna keep the oldest growth because we know that we need leaves and what leaves are is basically the mouth to the plant. This makes the food, but we're not gonna use the whole leaf. We're gonna cut the leaf in half. And the reason behind that again is, um, to, pre is to prevent desiccation. We don't want the plant to dry out. But we've got enough of the leaf to, to give it a good start. So I'm going to cut the leaves in half. I'm going to take off the leaves that will probably be in the soil. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to score it right there near the bottom as well to increase the amount of water absorption while it's in the ground until it roots. Um, where I just actually cut and I've actually you know, seen it while it's rooting, most of the roots will actually come where I just scored it. Like that'll be like one of the first places the roots will come out. And then I'll just take my rooting hormone and dip it like so. And it's done. It's ready to go on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, now we just do another one. But you, you, the goal is this is what it should look like while it's in the ground. This will have a better chance at life than this. Like if you stick this in the ground, this is just going to dry out. But then you got this. We'll do one more thing to give it a, another, another little push. So we'll spray with some sunblock too. So I just sprayed it with um, the Ivory Organics. It's diluted with just water just to keep it a little cooler on the leaf. So all these will be right here. Okay. I'm going to go back to the program. We've probably got like three more minutes to go. Um, transplanting and potting trees we did. Ivy Organics, we just talked about it. It basically um, is a repellent against um, insects and rodents, um, as well as the sunblock. It's organic, um, non-toxic, environmentally safe. Um, I'm going to tell you about how to get the product. If you see me afterwards, I basically have a sheet which will tell you where to buy it from. Um, Home Depot, Amazon, um, eBay, there's um, Arbico Organics is another recent retailer, the one of the top online for selling organic products. Um, but there's a list of them. I just want different people to go in different places and put reviews. You'll actually help me with the review process and put me a year ahead because um, it usually takes about 100 sales to get one review. So um, if you can help me out with that, hugely appreciated. Um, so it depends on what you're doing. If like this tomato plant, um, and I didn't even water it, it still hasn't wilted yet. Um, but the, the, the result, if you're just using it as sunblock spray, is immediate. Um, if you're painting your trunk, it's preventative. Um, for this avocado tree, which I'm taking back to the nursery, I only brought it for demonstration purposes because they're selling it like this. Um, so whoever takes it home, it's probably going to die on you as soon as you put it in the ground. And what's been keeping this alive, actually, is it was next to a dozen other avocado trees. They're all reaching for light near the top. But this trunk has been protected. But once you put it in your own garden, it's going to get so much more sun, and it's going to it's going to toast it. It'll be over. Um, so so I mean so for this, if I were to say I really care about you and I want to give you a shot, I would paint it and care for it and nurse it and hope eventually 
the living tissues will grow around the damage that was created and give it another shot. But I'm going to leave it for the next person that buys it. <laughs> Don't ask me, but if you look around, it's all around. I just yeah, gave you guys some yeah. something to look for when you're picking up your trees. Don't pick a tree. This looks beautiful to me on the top, yeah. but it's not going to last when you take it home. Um, and this is something I just picked up two days ago. So it's not something I did. Um, so we talked about NPK. I'm going to skip it. Why organic gardening? We know that. Um, organic gardening with fungi. I just want to say that the mushrooms that you see in your garden, those roots travel thousands of feet. They bring water and nutrients to your plants. When you see that oak tree on the top of the hill, um, you know, or those um, evergreens um, in Alaska that are getting the nutrients and all those dead salmon, you know, that are at the bottom. It's those mycorrhizal fungi um, that are actually bringing all of those elements and nutrients up to the top, you know, you know the tallest trees. Um, or the top of the hill, like those travel thousands of feet. Um, so your fungus are great in your garden. How do I make healthy soil? You can follow the slides. Homemade compost, how to do that. Fertilizing times, I'm going to share with you. You only fertilize three times out of the year. There's three main times of the year. And I know for some of you, you don't fertilize at all. Um, but if you can just tell yourself that um, spring, fertilize lightly. Um, the plant is warming up a little bit more in the summer. Um, and then again, one more time in the fall, just to give your plants a good start when they come back in the spring. But you never, unless there's a specific type of plant that needs fertilizer in the winter, you never fertilize in your winter. That's your, that's your season for just washing the soil, let it rain, let it clean, let it catch up. The plants are usually not doing much in the winter. Um, so winter is your three months you take a break from fertilizing. Organic pest controls. Um, I brought with me a couple of products. Okay, we'll go. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would actually help. And usually it's citrus again. Whenever I see a cut happening, too much light gets in and then the bark starts cracking. Um, infested now, you're talking about with the leaf miners, right? Leaf miners? If you're ready, I'm happy to visit. Um, <laughs> deal. Um, so, so here's, I'm just trying to finish this in the next couple of minutes. Um, so here's two products for organic pest control. This one here has, um, has mineral oil in it. Um, what we most hear off, uh, most often is neem oil. Neem oil helps with, um, it says insecticide, fungicide, miticide. It does a lot of things for your, um, for your plants. Um, with my tomatoes, I've seen aphids on it. Um, if you take a look at this, and I'm actually now going to put it on the table. This here is milkweed um, that I got from my garden. One foot away was this milkweed. And I don't know if you can see it from the back. It does look a little scrangly and whatever. But more importantly, it's covered with at least a 1,000 aphids on there as well. So when we're done, we'll put it in a plastic bag and toss it um, so they don't make their way in your garden. But, um, but we talked about um, um, aphids. How many of you here would actually treat this if you saw this in your garden? One, two. So most of you would not, and that's the reason I guess I've got this in my garden. These are my, um, my prey, you know, if this were the savanna. Um, these are the prey that are living in my garden. I'm telling you, one foot away, I got these beautiful plants. If I got one little stick, and the rest of the plant is healthy, it's just this that they happen to be chewing on, and the plant's like, you can have it. Um, but what these pests are actually doing is attracting all the predators, the praying mantis, the ladybugs, the, um, all the good things, the birds, the hummingbirds, the... All the other things that are actually going to eat those aphids is waiting right there and inviting them into my garden. If I actually spray them now with, and I'm now talking organic, we're not going to put, I brought some chemicals. I used to use seven like a decade ago. I still have it in my garage to show you guys. And here's spectricide. You know, you can put that and it'll basically turn your whole garden into a sterile environment where nothing lives, nothing good and nothing bad. Um, but if that's your goal, you know, and you want to grow things in a factory, you know, you can do that. But, um, but neem oil is something I use religiously on my citrus trees every um, middle of spring, almost through um, summer, fall. Um, the leaf miners attack almost all the citrus. I know here in Southern um, California, I'm pretty sure I haven't, I know a few people in Northern California that have a lot of citrus. I haven't paid attention to their leaves there. Um, but the citrus leaf miner will go in between the leaf. I don't see any of these here that are damaged. Um, they're usually grown indoors in a, in a, in a nursery environment um, before they're brought into the garden. Um, but 
the leaf miner will actually go in the middle of your citrus leaves and tunnel back and forth and basically call the whole, cause the whole leaf to curl. Um, most established trees can endure it. They're still making sugars, you know, and they're getting enough light and they're, and they're, and they're thriving. Um, but between compromising some of its health and more so for the appearance, I'll put neem oil on just those trees just to get them through that eight to 12 week period of time. By putting neem oil every two weeks and spinosad is another organic um, thing that you can alternate with so you're not doing the same thing every time to basically keep those leaf miners off my citrus and keeping those leaves healthy because you know with healthy leaves you're going to get a healthier tree for the rest of the year. Um, but that's like the only time I use anything organic as a pest control in my garden. My, all my vegetables, everything else, don't get it. Obviously my milkweeds don't get it um, and, th and that's pretty much it. Any questions on that? Well, yeah? That's it. It's leave it. You can wash it and try to revive it. Um, I, I they they come back within a, a few more days. More more than anything, like if it's really bad, you can cut them off, and then it'll grow some new growth. But the plant knows what it's doing too. Like it'll time itself, and when it's ready to grow, it'll grow so fast that those things cannot even catch up. Um, and there's going to be a lot more predators right now just through spring and summer. I've got at least ten. Um, praying mantis in my backyard that are like this small and I know within a matter of months they'll be giant and more important than anything and Ola knows more than anybody when it comes to that and when I do spray my citrus I warn Ola when she takes you know some cuttings I'm like I just did it a few days ago I might want to wait to wash them extra good um, but I've got some milkweed that's close to where my citrus are and and I'm careful usually not to get those even though they could benefit um, but I don't want to harm, and it's the reason for the milkweed, and even though it's not, I think, part of this presentation is, um, we're trying to help the monarch butterflies. And the monarch butterfly, this is the only plant that it'll lay its eggs on, and the only plant those caterpillars can eat is milkweed. Um, so when you see a monarch coming, it's because of one of these plants that they're actually able to be around us. Um, they'll feed on thousands of other flowers, but the only place they'll actually lay their eggs and those caterpillars will eat is milkweed. Um, so I brought here at least 15 plants for you guys to take home. I'll have hundreds by the summer. Um, so that'll be my big contribution will be just milkweeds. There won't be tomatoes there. Um, and um, I've already got them growing all over my garden. Yes. Yeah. I do recommend actually washing everything in your garden because we do live in Los Angeles and there's pollution that rains on all of our stuff every time it rains. And if you read anything about seeding clouds, apparently our last rain a couple weeks ago, they sprayed something in the atmosphere to make those clouds rain 15% more. Um, so it's just weird stuff. I mean, I, I see all these farmers, especially on YouTube, that are eating out of the garden. And it's like, I'm like why not wash it first? I got my gloves on. <laughs> I didn't touch your food either without, you know, like making sure I had my wipes with me, you know. Um, but yeah, I wash everything. I mean, it, it's, it's only, it's, it's the right thing to do. Sheila. You, said, you mentioned castor oil. What's the difference between the nitric acid and the castor oil? Yeah, so castor oil is typically used um, as a broadcast on your soil. And it's basically if you have a problem with any rodents, um, the moles, the voles, and like those types of things, there's products out there that um, pretty much formulate a granule that's got castor oil in it. Um, and then when you water the lawn, it basically goes into the soil and makes everything in the soil taste bad. And that's what, and that's taste bad. And that's what's in this, like you can hear the, the vial in there. There's, um, there's an oil product in there, which has got the neem and the castor oil. But when you paint it on the trees, it'll make everything taste bad. So it basically tells the plants, stay off of my trunk, but you're not putting it, um, you know, that's pretty much it. But it's not, it's not killing anything that comes into contact. It's only if it goes into the tree. If it's trying to get through it, it's not going to want to. Um, I gave you a slide over here that says, how do I get started? I gave you some addresses with nurseries where you can get some products. I talked about hydrolyzed fish over emulsions. Um, I gave you the phone number um, and address for Starbucks as well. Um, my daughter and I went to Starbucks yesterday and got like four of these. I only see two right now. But these are for you. Um, don't take my fertilizers because I need them for, to, for my garden. But there they are. So they're back there. So I'm going to put two more back there. But if you want coffee grounds, um, I don't recommend that you just put it around your plants, even though you can. Bless you. Um, 
but I recommend that if you've got a compost pile or if you've got other things you're mixing it with, do that. But if you're using it solely and exclusively as a fertilizer, I don't think it's doing much. Like it's, its contribution is very minimal. Don't rely on it solely, but again, I would mix it with other things. It's one more part. The slides in here talk about brown and green, um, um, you know, using 50% brown, 50% green products to basically warm um, the two products into creating good soils. Um, and I forgot what side this was on, but um, this is one of the elements that can go into making a good compost. Yes? It adds acid to the soil. It adds acid, so great for tomatoes, great for blueberries, gardenias, azaleas, like all of those things could benefit from, from the acid element. I'm going to put this back here. So those three bags. So take that. You're going to take all of those plants with you. Um, we got to get to the salt. That was the fun part. So that'll be the last thing I do, and then we'll do it. Um, I put the periodic table here for you so you can see, like, you know, things are made out of a lot of elements, and you want to get as many elements in, as you can in your soil. Those are the elements that are going to go into your food. If you put miracle Grow in your soil, that means you're eating miracle Grow. Um, believe it or not, that's the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and potassium, and all the things that you're getting out of it. Or you can go and put a fish in the soil and eat fish in your squash and your tomatoes or whatever else. You know my point. You're getting, you're getting, you're getting whatever that source is is going right into your food. So put, start, off with, start off with better things. Um, Okay, let's do the salt real quick. Um, where did it go? Does anybody see it? Green bag right here. So for green plants, there's a couple products I brought with me today. This here is the first, which is iron chelate. It says 10% iron. Um, so you can take this product, you can um, add like a teaspoon, tablespoon to a gallon of water and water your plants usually once a month if they appear not to be green enough. So iron is one part of what it takes to um, make your plants green. If you actually go to the um, slide where it says, is NPK, which stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, enough for your plants? And I wrote, no. Um, on this slide, it talks about plants need more than three elements to survive and thrive. Um, it's another reason for composting. Put a lot of different ingredients you know, um, into your compost. What iron does is assist in the manufacture of chlorophyll, um, magnesium, which is now the importance of the salt. And I'm so glad somebody said salt. I almost like finished. Um, and don't worry about your grass. Um, a couple flakes are coming down. Um, I'm looking for my spoon. Yeah, that's why I said off of my notice, do not try this at home without first coming to this class. Um, so what this is is Epsom salt. Um, and don't just get any Epsom salt like, you know, that you use for your water softener or anything else. Like, make sure it's for plants. Like, I don't want to be liable for you guys, like, destroying, you know, your whole, your whole backyard by putting the wrong stuff. This here is specifically formulated for plants. It's Epsom salt. The two, um, we know that table salt is, does anybody want to guess? We'll do a little chemistry. NaCl. NaCl, sodium chloride. Um, so he's looking at the periodic table. You don't even have the program in your hand. John Smart. So NaCl, sodium, sodium chloride, is table salt. What this is is MgS, um, magnesium sulfate. Um, and if you take a look at your, um, I mean, you can see it's as white as, I mean, it's as white as table salt. It looks like snow here. Um, and I've actually taken a tablespoon of this to test it out to see. And you're only supposed to put about a tablespoon per gallon of water. And you can water, depending on the plants, once a month or once a season. But I actually took one of these and put it all around the tomato and watered it and nothing happened. I don't want to say it did better or worse. I only did it a, a couple weeks ago um, just to see if it was going to burn like table salt would definitely kill my tomato plant. Nothing happened. Um, but the point is you can, um, you can take this. I usually put it in my gallon of water before I add the water. This is already full of water, but I put it in there. And then when you fill it up with water, it's stirring as it fills up. You'd water around the trees. The other thing you would do as well is, um, I wouldn't put in this guy, but I got another gallon of water over here. What? Oh, so he asked, what's the purpose of the salt? The program states, magnesium is needed for chlorophyll production, sulfur to help maintain a dark green color while encouraging more vigorous plant growth. Sulfur is needed to manufacture chlorophyll. So you can see here we're talking about three more elements, but there's still so much more the plant can benefit from just the things we've even said today. Um, but it's just to increase the awareness that, so this here is, I think a little more than a gallon, so I'm gonna put a little more. So this here is now full of magnesium sulfate. 
two more ingredients that plants need to be extra green. We're going to shake it up. And now what I'll do, aside from not this one, but this one. Um, so aside from watering around the base of the tree, you can then take this also, read the directions to find out how dilute it needs to be depending on the plants. Again, um, and then you would just spray the whole plant. And this is another way that the plant will actually take in the magnesium and the sulfates that are necessary to turn your plants from whether they're yellow or light green to a super dark green. Um, so here's two tips that I told you for turning your plants green. Um, I've never run this much over, so I'm going to wrap it. Um, thank you guys all for your participation. Um, this was a lot of fun. Um, if you take a look at the program now where it comes to the giveaways, I just want to share with you what's there. And if I can call on Bob and was it Deborah at the beginning? Who's going to help me with the like raffle stuff? Um, I just want to tell you what's there. So when you make your way there, what I'm going to do is Yeah, if you see anything here you have questions about, see me. Um, I, I had so much to share. Spring is my favorite time of the year, if you haven't already um, noticed. Um, but yeah, th there's so much to say, so much to do. Um, if you have any questions up here, I'd be happy to share with you. There is um, reasons for the eggshells that I have up here, but I'm not going to go into it right now. Um, the plants that I have with me today is the plumeria that you already know. Um, and I've got some rooting hormone, so if you want to pick that up, I'm going to leave the rooting hormone there. I'm taking the lid off. They're actually a whitish yellow, whitish yellow. Um, so I'm going to put this here. So if anybody wants to dip, they can dip. Um, so the other things I got is the early girl and the cherry. So when you come, if you want one, pick one. Um, I've got the milkweeds, um, a shining pink rock um, pulse lane. Let me actually show you that. That's this right here. My inspiration behind this is Sandy across the street. Um, if you take a look at her landscaping, they're beautiful flowers. I've now got them um, blooming in the front of my property. So I've got about seven or eight of these cuttings. If you want to take these home, they're succulents, need very little water once established. Here we go. Um, so we got the Colorado blue spruce. I put some heights. I researched just so you know, you know what you're putting in the ground before it goes and destroys your property. Douglas fir, um, this is a new word for me. For, Thank you for that. Um, so I've got two of those plants. They basically grow into um, these very yellow looking plants in the spring before the leaves actually come in late spring through summer. Um, and they grow on average about eight to 10 feet. So they're a manageable, beautiful yellow looking um, bush slash tree that's about eight to 10 feet. I got one weeping willow my um, daughter actually found at the zoo. You know, the weeping willow is like, you know, it kind of creates that canopy umbrella. Um, she took one to her school and I've got one more left over here. Um, a red maple, I've got one of those as well. And my ask is, if you can go to, um, on Facebook, the Hollywood Knowles Manor Lake Ridge. I know there's a few people that have posted their success stories or their butterflies in their garden or whatever. Um, but I'd like you guys to take advantage of it. I removed all of my, as much as I can, real estate stuff that was on there before. So it's more so for you guys to exchange and communicate. Um, so if you can share your plant stuff, um, I'd love to see it um, on the Hollywood Knowles Manor Lake Ridge, which is our community Facebook that I created a couple years ago for us. And it has on it, by the way, for anybody that doesn't have the Globe Pass for free parking. And um, I know they gave away free tickets next door um, for the park. Um, it tells you how to do all of that in there. Um, any notices um, from our board meetings that I think is you know, informative for the community, you'll find it there too. So that's there. Um, you have your product on there so you can share it? So the, totally worth it for me. Um, the product retails for about $30, just to let you know. So. Um, so between that and this and this, there's a lot of value in this class today. And, but what's of more value than everything is you guys. This was the, my favorite class. How long is the camp sacred for like Once you add water to the product, right. about two weeks. Right, but I mean, they can keep it in the can. Five years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just use what you need. I brought some oh. uh, fig trees and some ferns and a couple of lemongrass. <laughs> lemongrass. Lemongrass. Looking back over there, there's one medjool date tree there. There's um, two guava trees there. There's um, those trumpet lilies that hang upside down that are there. Um, both Bob and Deborah will help you find the plants that you want. Um, again, thank you guys for everything. And when you're done and get your plants, let's take a picture as a group. 
So I hope you enjoyed our spring gardening class meeting this morning and I'm now in another part of the garden here with the milkweeds and that's going to be part of our summer uh, discussions and we're going to be talking about the importance of introducing milkweed plants into your garden to help sustain the um, monarch butterflies in our community as this is the only plant that monarch butterflies actually lay their eggs on and their caterpillars can eat and we're fortunate enough this morning to actually see um, a monarch caterpillar right here um, on this leaf and hopefully you can zoom in and see that. There we go. And it's quite special with the um, yellow, white, and black zebra markings along its body. But this one here is about a few days away from turning into a chrysalis and then about a week and a half away from turning into um, another monarch butterfly within our community. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please don't forget to like it and also subscribe so you don't miss our videos as we continue to post them throughout the year. Um, we have so many more helpful tips and useful information to share with you. And again, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much to J.G. Sebastian for his jazz entertainment as well as um, recording.